Oh, welcome. Uh, I'm Hans Rodenburg uh, from the Scientific Bureau of the Dutch Green Party. Uh, we're hosting this webinar as part of a project of the Green European Foundation uh, called Cities as Places of Hope. And in this project, we uh, bring together local politicians from all over Europe and highlight inspiring examples of green local politicians uh, who are really making a difference uh, in their cities. We have two guests who will both uh, give a presentation of about 50 minutes. Um, and after both those presentations, we start uh, the discussion. Um, now, the first uh, guest is uh, I would like to introduce tonight is uh, Tom Lloyd Goodwin. And, and Tom is an associate director of CLES, which is pronounced CLES, if I'm uh, right. And that's the Net National Organization for Local Economies um, in Great Britain. Uh, they help city councils all over the United Kingdom to develop economies that bring maximum benefits to people and places within the limits of the environment, or so it says on their website. Um, and one of the ways in which they do that is through the concept of community wealth building um, that we are talking about here tonight. Um, CLES is one of the most important drivers in, in the United Kingdom of community wealth building. Um, and Tom is here to tell us all about it. So uh, Tom, great to have you here and uh, the floor is all yours. Thanks so much, Hans. Um, thanks so much for inviting me here this evening. It's, it's a, a real pleasure, as always, to be kind of here in the Netherlands, albeit virtually on, on this occasion. I wish I wish we could be together in, in person. The Netherlands was actually the last place that I visited before we went into lockdown. And I was talking about community wealth building uh, in Rotterdam, actually, to a number of community groups. Um, so it's great to see uh, the concept continue to gain traction. It's great to hear that you're thinking about community wealth building uh, in Amsterdam too. Obviously, Amsterdam's uh, embraced donor economics, which is great. If, if any of you are interested, we recently ran a webinar with Kate Rayworth, the author of, of Donut Economics, uh, that was at the beginning of September. We were exploring the significant overlap between community wealth building and donut economics. So do go onto YouTube and, and have a look at that if, if you're interested. But this evening then, I'll talk about um, I'm here to talk about community wealth building, obviously, and I'll talk about the way in which we've been working with numerous localities across the UK to implement community wealth building strategies on the ground. Um, I'll talk a bit about theory, uh, but I'll also talk about practice, of course, and give some practical examples of the kind of work that Claire's has been doing. So I hope that that all sounds uh, OK. Um, Hans, you've all already given a good fulsome introduction, but just a little bit about me and Claire's just before, before I, I kind of crack on. So as you said, yeah, I'm, I'm Associate Director of Policy here at Claire's. I, I head up a team that writes uh, all of our publications. I come and talk at events like this and generally look to articulate Claire's view on the political economy. Um, Claire's, as you say, is the national organization for, for local economies. We're all about progressive economics for people, for place and for planet. And we've got a firm commitment to places and communities who are experiencing social and economic inequality and lack of opportunity. And our fundamental aim really then is to achieve social justice, good local economies and effective public services for everybody everywhere. Um, so let me start just with a bit of context setting and, and saying something about the moment that, that we're now in and, and why we need a different approach to economics, to economics, economic development and why community wealth building is, is, so, is so relevant right now. So for the last 18 months, of course, we've been in the grip of, of a major public health and economic event potentially, well, definitely unprecedented really in its magnitude in peacetime. But it's it's really important to say that even before COVID hit, that our operating context was already affected by many long-standing and intersecting crises. So despite the fact that economic growth has risen dramatically in, uh, since the 1980s in countries like the UK, in countries like the Netherlands, where it's, it's nearly quadrupled. Um, recent statistics show us that, that actually, you know, our economy is failing to deliver for people, for place and for planet. I'll refer to some UK statistics, but, you know, I, my sense is that, that, that they're pretty similar in the Netherlands too. But in the UK right now, poverty is at a record high. Um, almost a million people now have no guaranteed work from one week to the next. They're on zero hour precarious contracts. 
Uh, life expectancy has recently stalled for the first time in a century in the UK, particularly in areas of deprivation. It's actually starting to go backwards. So a, a truly shocking statistic, really. And, and of course, we, we all face the ongoing mortal threat of climate emergency, the full fury of which seems to have appeared almost everywhere this summer, where we've seen waves of, of violent heat, violent rain, smashing records, killing hundreds of people and reminding us that unless we urgently change tack that our planet remains on a pathway to human made destruction. And the worry, of course, is that at the moment, there's this kind of sense of, oh, let's get back to the old normal. Let's let's get back to our offices. Let's get the roaring 20s up and running. But based on what we had before COVID-19, this amounts to little more than let's get the old patterns of wealth extraction, poverty, inequality back into play. And there's a strong sense then, I think, that if the purpose of our economy is to be more than just a wealth rating machine for an elite group of people, that given where we are at the moment, that our economy is failing to deliver for people, place and planet. But of course, with, 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 with alternatives like community wealth building, uh, we do have the promise of something different. So let me move into an exploration of this concept. So community wealth building in a nutshell then is about trying to harness the power of large institutions and particularly public institutions and to start to enable uh, local economies to grow and to develop from, from within. And we refer to these large institutions as anchor institutions. So, you know, large institutions that are, that are rooted in local communities that can start to use their size and impact to improve economic, social and environmental well-being. So in practice, this means local councils, hospitals, universities, but potentially also the private sector too, if they can be convinced to focus on more of a triple bottom line approach. So concern for the environment and workers as, as, as well as a, dri a drive for profit. So, you know, how do they use their impact to do this then? Well, first and foremost, it's, it's about establishing the right kind of, of economic strategy. And here there's a role, a particular role for local governments, for regional governments. So at Claire's, we talk about the importance of trying to build inclusive economies. So economies that are focused on social goals, social justice, environmental sustainability, and prosperity for everybody. Uh, economies that, have, that decouple this idea that, that economic success is contingent on growth and, and recognize that continual growth on a finite planet with finite resources is of course impossible. And this really requires abandoning uh, gross domestic product as the leading GDP, as the leading indicator of economic health and to instead ab in, uh, adopt a broader set of metrics. So livelihood, well-being, happiness, poverty reduction, uh, carbon reduction too. So we need our economic strategies to have more of this kind of focus. What we also need in our economic strategies is, is a commitment to reshape business support at a local level and to focus uh, on stopping wealth being extracted out of our local economies and committing to growing more socially productive forms of business where the focus is not about maximizing profits to distant shareholders. Uh, and we call these kinds of business businesses generative businesses uh, the profit and surplus is created, is shared more broadly between owners and workers, allowing wealth and opportunity to flow through to local people and to local places. So in practice, this means more social enterprises, more cooperatives and worker owned businesses, as well as private businesses that, as I say, are committed to the triple bottom line. So in addition to the strategy and the, and the reshaping of business support, it's also about harnessing the everyday practices of these large uh, anchor institutions uh, for greater economic, social and environmental impact. So, you know, the large councils, universities, hospitals spend billions of pounds within, within our local economies. So can more of this money be directed towards more locally productive forms of business, enabling that wealth and resource to be kept within the confines of the local economy? Um, they employ potentially thousands of people, you know, so can can they offer better terms and conditions? Can they pay the real living wage? Can they look to recruit people from areas of deprivation within our cities and towns and rural areas too? Um, they often have large sources of financial resource like their pension funds. So can more of this be used to invest in local priorities and divest from things like fossil fuels? Um, they often have surplus land. 
So could this be transferred to the community or could it be used to build affordable housing rather than being sold off uh, to that to the highest bidder? So used in the right way, these that these 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 assets can start to produce tangible benefits for local communities and they can start to impact on what we call the social determinants of health. So things like health, income, economic equality, job stability, a sense of agency and purpose and access to safe and affordable housing. So to illustrate the way in which we can start to do this at a local level, let me let me turn to some practical examples uh, of our work at Clares. So I'll, I'll refer first to the example of Preston. It's often been dubbed the, the Preston model. It's kind of the quintessential example of, of community wealth building, really. So in Preston, we work with a collective of, of six different large anchor institutions that have been brought together by the City Council. So in Preston, they'd, they'd originally bought into what we might call the classic neoliberal inward investment dream, where it was kind of build the big shopping centre, build fancy restaurants, cinemas, and economic opportunity will trickle down for all to share. Now, the financial crash happened and that opportunity evaporated and they were thinking, well, what are we going to do now? That led them to some of our work and to the idea of community wealth building. And we started to work with the, with the council and that group of anchor institutions over a, over a four year period. The first thing we did was, was focus on this idea of, 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 of spending and trying to spend more money in the local economy with more of those locally productive forms of business that I mentioned. Uh, and what we did over a, over a four or five year period was began to reshape the market for goods and services with those anchor institutions and grow more of those locally rooted companies uh, within the economy. Um, in terms of impact, what that meant, it meant kind of 70 million pounds more for the city economy, pounds more for the regional economy in light of the multiplier effect that you get when you spend more money in a local economy it created 1600 more jobs they didn't just focus on spending though we got them to focus on those other aspects of, of those other assets that they had so employment they started paying uh, the real living wage 4,000 more people were paid the real living wage they thought about developing their economy more how could they grow more food cooperatives uh, more tech cooperatives uh, in their in their area. They they start to think about finance and their pension funds, and they've they, they've invested in affordable housing. They're thinking about municipal energy. They're even thinking about a community bank. Now, in terms of what this has done for Preston, when we started our work, Preston was one of the most deprived cities in the UK. It was in the bottom twenty percent. After that four year piece of work, Preston had moved out of that, that bottom 20% and it's now been voted the most improved place to live in the UK. Um, in Birmingham, we, we've done we've done a, a, a similar thing. We've established a network of, of anchor institutions to um, maximise the benefit that they can bring to the Birmingham economy. So that's that's the local NHS, it's universities, it's the council, it's housing associations. And in Birmingham, what we've done is we've actually introduced the UK's first community wealth builder in residence. So a coordinator, a community wealth building coordinator that works across the different anchor institutions to share good practice and implement community wealth building strategies. And to that end, our, our network coordinator or our community wealth builder in residence is working to establish a database of preferred local socially productive suppliers who can then um, kind of provide anchor institutions with their goods and services. Um, in Scotland, in the UK, so in the UK, of course, we have devolved government. So Scotland is, is, is the first national government to adopt a whole scale community wealth building approach. Uh, Scotland have, have appointed a new minister for community wealth. Uh, they're looking at introducing a community wealth building act. Um, at Clares, we've overseen a number of projects across different localities in Scotland. So uh, we've we've written community wealth building action plans, uh, which are now being implemented. So it is really taking off uh, across the UK. Um, just before I conclude, uh, uh, um, let, but one thing we often get asked is, well, tell me more about tell tell me more about how you implement these things. How do you shift? public expenditure? How do you really redirect jobs towards people who, who need them the most? So let me just briefly say something about that. So in relation to progressive employment, for example, we're seeing some great examples of the local NHS in the UK doing really great things in this space. So uh, at a local level in the UK, we have uh, NHS trusts or health boards who are 
groups of different hospitals and they employ thousands of people and the approach they take to employment can make a massive difference to people's lives so one particular hospital group here in greater manchester where where we're based has they they've got rid of, of advertising jobs and interviewing people for all of their entry-level positions and they're now reserving all of those entry-level positions for local residents in areas of deprivation who've been on these very targeted pre-employment training programs that they set up. So they've, they've basically looked at their employment profile. They've identified deprived areas where they're not employing people. And they've designed these very specific pre-employment training programs to enable people to enter their workplace. And crucially for them, it's no longer about who is the best person for the job. It's about how can we use our employment opportunities to address poverty, deprivation and inequality. Um, second, just, just briefly then on, on progressive spending. With progressive spending, of course, it's not just about spending more money locally. It's about trying to direct that money towards more socially productive businesses. So in Newham, which is a council in Greater London, what they've done in, in social care and in home care, so care within people's homes, they've taken what was once one big contract and they split it into eight small contracts. And they said, OK, so it's one contract per supplier. So that's immediately disincentivized the big, large, extractive care home companies from coming in and swooping up the contract. And they've also said that suppliers must, they must pay the real living wage, they must employ local people, and they must be based within the borough. So within the borough of, of, of Newham, that, that council area. And what, they, what you, we have now in, in Newham in London is eight local small businesses who are required to operate in a more socially productive way. So paying the real living wage, who are now delivering their home care. So brief conclusion, just kind of a final word on, on opportunities and challenges. So poverty, deprivation, climate emergency, COVID-19 has, has exposed the underlying fragilities and failings in our economies. To address those challenges though, as, as I hope I've explained, there is real opportunity for groups of large anchor institutions to come together in place to use their assets to build and develop local economies from within. To realize that things like public expenditure is not just a cost to the public purse, but it's an opportunity to stimulate demand in the local economy. We've got to remember though, that these kinds of interventions, whilst they're feasible, they're not easy. They run counter to the mainstream. You know, I talked about the importance of economic strategy and planning, but you know, it can be a bit of an add on here. Local councils will say, well, we'll have our normal strategy, which is about growth and inward investment and high tech sectors. And we'll maybe do a little bit of community wealth building and add that on. Whereas really, you know, we need economic strategies to be all about community wealth building and not just a, a kind of an add on at the end. Um, addressing climate emergency and environmental breakdown is, of course, another huge challenge. Uh, we're doing a lot of work at the moment to, to really think about how these community wealth building interventions that I've talked about can do more to address climate emergency. Tomorrow, actually, we're releasing a major new toolkit for councils called a community wealth building energy transition. And this will focus on uh, shifting the way in which energy systems operate and talk more about community energy and how we can do and implement that more at a local level. Despite these challenges, though, final word, despite these challenges, though, given where we are, given where we are in national policy terms at the moment with the kind of policies you know, our government, certainly in Westminster, are coming out with, it really is the local level where we must do battle for social, economic and ecological justice. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. That's great. I want to give room for one or two uh, clarifying questions, and then we'll uh, start a discussion uh, after the next presentation. Um, does anyone have a, a, a clarifying question for Tom? Perhaps can you uh, give in one or two sentences the, the argumentation why the local level is the level to address this uh, problem? For in my experience in the city council, I always get uh, the argument that, well, there's national politics, we cannot do anything about it. So can you point it out? Yeah, I mean, I think almost you've, you've answered the question. I think it's because... It's because of the absence of, of leadership and direction at the national policy level that we have no alternative but to think about, well, we must 
do things at a local level. Okay, the exception is, is Scotland in the UK where it is being implemented at a national level, but in the UK, we, we won't see a change of government for another four years. And they're not, they're not interested in any of this. So we've got to get on at a local level and really start to think about, well, how can we change practice at a local level to, to, to kind of solve these problems that we face in our local economy. So the lo we've got no alternative but to do it locally at the moment. Thanks. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering uh, earlier in your presentation, you said that uh, COVID has kind of put a stop to everything, but do you also see COVID as, a, as an opportunity for, uh, for, for us to start a new process? I do. Well, certainly our national government in the UK is, you know, hell bent on us getting back to normal and getting back to our offices. But when I speak to a lot of economic development teams in local councils in the UK, they're kind of like, yes, COVID was that wake up moment where we realized there was a disconnect between our economic development practice and, and, and outcomes for people on the ground. So I think it has been a, a motivating factor and a recognition that, I think that and those other statistics that I mentioned, you know, in, in, we did have some very shocking statistics just before COVID. Those those statistics about life expectancy going backwards, uh, poverty at a record high. Um, yeah, that, I think that has been a big wake up call for people. But yes, it, COVID has been motivating. Thanks. Thank you. The second guest tonight is uh, Simeon Blom. Uh, Simeon has been a council member for the Dutch Green Party GroenLinks for seven years now. Uh, in Amsterdam and was a candidate also for the Green Party at the national elections this year. Um, as a council member, uh, Simeon has always worked to achieve a more just and inclusive society, and especially in uh, the social economical weaker neighborhoods of Amsterdam, uh, like the Belmer. Uh, and in his uh, endeavor, uh, he launched an initiative called Meer Waarde voor de Wijk, uh, which translates as more value for the neighborhood. Um, he did this together with his uh, colleagues Imana Nadif and Femke Roosma. Um, and it's a plan that resolves completely around community wealth building. Uh, and he's here to tell us more about it. So uh, yes. welcome, Simeon, and the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Hans. And uh, thank you, <coughs> the people from Het Wetenschappelijk Bureau, um, for uh, organizing this event and for the invitation. and. I must, and of course, welcome to everyone who is listening. Um, I think it's really inspiring um, to have you all here and to hear the, and look at the presentation of Tom because I really recognize a lot of things. Uh, so further in my speech, I will uh, tell something about it. Uh, I, I realized that it's <clears throat> really interesting to talk about economics and I ne never knew that I, it will be this interesting uh, as it is, I'm really uh, uh, enthusiastic about it. And it has to do with the way that uh, this approach is a new, innovative, circular uh, approach. Um, it's really what we need. Um, it's different than the neoliberal dominance we have here in the Netherlands. Um, my name is Simeon Blom and I am a proud member of the Green Party in the Netherlands. And uh, as the introduction uh, said, I am also a member of the city council. And the reason why I became politically uh, political ac active lies in the reason why we introduced this new approach. Um, because inequality has been increasing in the Netherlands and also in Amsterdam for years. Um, we see that, that inequality is more concentrated in certain districts in our city, for example, Amsterdam Southeast, the Belmer, the, the district where I grew up, um, the district where I live, and also the district that inspired me to, um, yeah, to become more active in the society and in the uh, politics. Um, as far as uh, GroenLinks Amsterdam is concerned, um, we, from the moment we uh, became the biggest in the city for the first time we got in power, we introduced a Southeast master plan. Um, and we aim with that master plan to stop the growing inequality. Uh, and it, as I said it already, 
it is especially districts like Southeast who face that uh, the negative aspects of inequality. We see it in deep, we see it in deep poverty. We see it in uh, social issues like uh, criminality, um, and that needs to stop. What we said when you want to invest in something like a master plan, a plan that will take 20 years, it will be an, an, an um, yeah, plan of 20 years, we should invest in the basic. And the basic is um, that people should be able to earn uh, enough money so that they can live and not survive. And we uh, uh, submitted a com community wealth building initiative um, and it's an approach, as Tom already said, aimed at enhancing the wealth and ownership of communities and individuals. And the point is that jobs and the economy are entered locally as much as possible and that the capital benefits as many local residents and entrepreneurs as possible. This provides more local stability. That is what we, we really believe. We want uh, the positive international experiences, as um, for example, Preston, um, to inspire us and other districts in Amsterdam to do the same. And we are proud that during the negotiations on the Corona uh, crisis, uh, the coalition agreed that we should invest on this way to get out of the crisis. And Amsterdam Southeast is in the Netherlands, um, the place where the most money is earned per square kilometer. And I said, uh, it's also uh, one of the poorest areas in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands. It's, uh, we have a lot of uh, headquarters of international companies and also national companies uh, here in this same area with high poverty rates. How, how can that uh, be, be possible in such an area that so much wealth is accumulated and at the same time, there is so much poverty and we see that um, we need to make the right choices, especially when it comes to our economy and the way wealth is distributed. Together with experts from Southeast, we have thought about how the money earned in Southeast can also flow back into the dis districts so that the residents and entrepreneurs can benefit better. And of course, this uh, approach is not a ready-made solution, um, but a proposal for a sustainable cooperation, especially a co cooperation between the mun municipality, various people, initiatives, organ organizations, and companies in Southeast to build a new economy together. And what are we go going to do then? Uh, first, we will do research uh, on how does it look that the, how does the capital flow looks in this area? Mm. What comes in and what goes out? Uh, what goes out in the pockets of uh, uh, CEOs, in the pockets of shareholders, and uh, and and we also will do research on the way our informal economy looks like. We have a big informal economy in Southeast. We have a lot of people who are baking cookies <laughs> at home, who are making, uh, who have a catering, who are making clothes uh, at home. We also have a yeah, big illegal taxi uh, circuit. We call that snodders. Um, and people do that because they don't earn enough to live. Um, and we are going to research how does that money flow looks like. We also will facilitate an incubator for cooperations. Um, we have a lot of people with good ideas, um, but sometimes they need um, yeah, inspiration from international examples. Uh, sometimes they, they need uh, training, a course. Sometimes they need money, a start uh, capital to invest. And I'm so proud to see that here in this area, we now have, are busy with uh, a windmill in the Kaapuurt, one of the yeah, vulnerable areas in, in our city, but the uh, local residents will have their own windmill as a cooperation. And I said, the benefits of that cooperation 
why don't we put it in community well-being? So it can really be circular. Also, what we're going to do, of course, we will make agreements with institutions, with ent enter institutions, and also companies to hire local people more. As I said, it's one of the areas in the Netherlands where per square kilometer, the most money is earned in the Netherlands because of, because of all the headquarters, but not many people from this area work in those headquarters. Uh, so we really have a big polarization inequality uh, in this area. So we are going to make agreements with those companies to hire local people, to organ organize traineeships, and when you hire those people, pay them good. Um, and also what we are going to do is make agreements with those companies and also institutions for local purchasing. Um, because uh, as I said, we have a lot of talents. Here. We have a lot of people who are, are expert in whatever, um, do the purchasing locally. Um, I'm really inspired by an initiative of some uh, young men here in, the, in Southeast. They have an African background. Um, they contacted uh, the people they know in, in Africa. They bought a, a piece of land. Uh, they are going to uh, 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 pay the farmers uh, a good wage in a circular, circular uh, way. Um, and they will plant beans coffee beans, and they want to purchase the coffee beans here locally in, in, from the perspective of community well-building. So it's really circular the way we are doing it. They will hire young people, they will, will train young people, and um, for us it's important the way those coffee beans are produced, human rights should be uh, upfront. Um, what we are also going to do is uh, look and re do re research on what and how many public buildings we have and what public buildings we can give to those corporations, for, to those initiatives, uh, so that they can start on a an, on an, uh, good way. I'm also proud of an other initiative um, in one of the areas we have here in Southeast, in Amsterdam, Fence Polder. Again, also one of the vulnerable areas we have um, and uh, it is also an area where you see that the use, use of healthcare is high. Um, yeah, but it's really high. And a few years ago, there was a uh, lady who said, um, no, I'm going to work with especially women who are vulnerable and we are going to do kitchen gar gardening. Uh, it started really small and the last year it gr grew. Um, <clears throat> And recently they came to the ID uh, to, uh, to uh, become a cooperation. They are really big. They have several kitchen gardening places. Um, they have won a lot of prizes because since their initiative started, you see a better quality of life because of social cohesion, because people are meeting uh, uh, each other, because they are doing something with green uh, things. Uh, with vegetables, it's really positive. They are going to make a cooperation and they will sell the vegetables they planted. And better, with the money they earn, they will start another cooperation. Uh, and they call it community wealth and health. Since we know that the use of healthcare in that area is high, we know that uh, the contract, the, 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 the um, the one that uh, give healthcare, uh, they, they get big contracts. But why can we not uh, democrat, uh, democratize that and give the people the right uh, to organize it themselves? Um, so that's really something which I'm really interested uh, in. So we, all, we do this all to create an economy, not for the few, but for the many the many who were marginalized. And I think it's their time to take ownership of their economy to achieve social justice they finally deserve. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Simeon. It's always uh, a pity we can't applaud you uh, with a lot of sound. Uh, 
<laughs> at a webinar. Um, so I saw a lot of uh, some questions coming in, uh, but before before we go to the uh, questions of the public, I will want to give you and Tom the possibility to ask some questions to each other because I can imagine you listened to each other's stories and uh, wanted to know more about some things. I really want to I really want to compliment Tom and his organization for all the work they are doing, all the art articles they are writing. <laughs> doing research because it really helps. It really helps in being inspired, in seeing perspectives and also showing the people, look, hey, we have examples internationally where it works. And I must say the biggest fight and um, challenge are not the people. The biggest challenge are the one who work in institutions like the government. Mm. Uh, to, to um, because everyone is uh, locked up in the system we have right now, the neoliberal system. And uh, we really need to plant this idea in people, people's head that it can be different. There are other options. Yeah. So that's really an, an, a challenge. And your articles and other examples uh, helps us to, uh, to do that. I have one question. Um, um, can you, the way uh, you did it in, in England, uh, in, in several cities, for example, Preston, Preston did you uh, use legal options, for example, enforcing uh, institutions in working from these perspectives? No, there was, there was, we didn't, we did, there, there was no kind of, there was no legal compliance <clears throat> with, the, with the shifting of spend. It was very much done by if you take the big contracts and split them down into smaller contracts, then they they become less appealing to, to the big companies and you start to get into the, the areas where the smaller local socially productive companies become more interested. And then it was about encouraging um, the council and the other anchor institutions to do things that we call meet the buyer events, where they'll go out and they'll meet suppliers and they'll kind of start to build relationships with the local suppliers and, and say to them, hey, you know, it's OK, you can you should be tendering for these opportunities too." like because of procurement law. What was what was once UK procurement law for us? But sadly, sadly, no, no, sadly, no longer UK procurement law. It's um, we st obviously we still we're still subject to kind of um, WTO procurement rules so you, you know there are certain regulations there so you can't you can we, you can't just hand out contracts to people so you have to do it within those kind of constraints so but then no, there was no legal compliance it was done through kind of negotiation uh and and kind of you know talking to people and, and building relationships yeah. yeah okay thank you but yeah i mean it's it was, it was wonderful to hear to, to hear your, your your input simeon and it's 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 as inspiring to us to hear that other places are you know, well, you know, taking these ideas and, and running with them too, you know, and, 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 and contributing your own methods and practices and approaches. I thought, you know, the, the kitchen garden idea sounded fascinating. I don't know whether you've, you've started to kind of uh, think about, well, could, though, could the kitchen garden start to supply the big anchor institutions with, with, with food? Would that be a mechanism that, that you, could, you, could, you could start to help that kitchen garden to grow and, and, to, and to be bigger? So that's really one of the, uh, the name of the kitchen garden is Bloei en Groei. So for the yeah. Dutch people who are interested in, in the, to, to know more, Bloei en Groei, they are really an example in the Netherlands, uh, especially uh, uh, when you look at the group of people they uh, can reach. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but that, that is their plan, uh, to sell their vegetables uh, yeah. to, uh, to, all, to the enter institutions. Yeah, and brilliant. I agree with our policy is to facilitate that, to help maybe invest, opening doors, uh, uh, having the conversations with the hospitals, the, the, the schools, the big companies, uh, so they can sell their uh, vegetables. So those yeah. people can better their lives because the yeah. reason why they have health issues has to do with poverty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And uh, yeah. You, you make a really important point, though, as well, Simeon, at the end there, where you say that the barriers are, are often the institutions themselves. I think that's what 
it's what I was trying to say at the end of my presentation, where it's it's often officers within the councils who, who might we might be saying, well, actually, well, we can't do that, you know, and they're very used to they're they're enshrined within a neoliberal way of working. They're enshrined within a particular model, and it's not necessarily their fault. It's just the way that they it's the way that people have been working for the last thirty years means that it's diff, it's very difficult to say. Let's stop thinking about inward investment and bringing in these big multinational companies and to think more about trying to grow locally socially productive businesses. That's, it, it, is that a challenge for, for, for you within, within Amsterdam Council as well then? I think, I think um, since we are the biggest, uh, so we now have that experience uh, uh, as a, a party that is in power, that is our biggest challenge. Hmm putting it in people's heads, that, yeah. that we can do it different, that we, that uh, growing of the economy is, why should that be the only aim we have as a society? Yeah, when yeah, growing yeah. Uh, of the economy means uh, in our system that inequality uh, increases uh, and that it has uh, a negative aspects. Why can we not do it uh, from a donut economy perspective? Or yeah, yeah, a yeah. Perspective? Yeah. So it's it's a challenge, yeah. and that's why I think it's uh, important to gr uh, grow a movement. So I'm yeah. so happy yeah. to see that there are Dutch people here uh, in, the, in this uh, webinar. We as a people, we we can do it, you know, uh, uh, in, in creating this uh, movement. So this can spread further in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, let's do that. Yes, uh, and that's a good moment to. Uh... Let the people speak. <laughs> um, does anyone have a question for Simeon or Tom? It was very interesting to uh, hear that uh, Tom says um, EU procurement law sadly no longer is UK procurement uh, law. Uh, does that mean that he doesn't see procurement law as uh, an obstacle to community wealth uh, building and a second question is uh, is linked to that uh, uh, EU procurement law of course gives uh, uh, companies for uh, from abroad a chance to bid for uh, government uh, contracts and uh, that might not always be bad uh, in the in view of um, let's say, cross-border uh, solidarity. If the municipality of Amsterdam uh, would want to develop a computer program or an app, um, they might say we want it to be done by uh, developers from Amsterdam, but there might also be a Bulgarian startup uh, able or willing to do the job. Uh, the average income in Bulgaria is less than half of the average income in uh, the Netherlands and certainly in uh, Amsterdam. So uh, would you still prefer local suppliers in, in that case? That's a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think the last question especially was uh, for, for me. That's a really good question. Um, I think one thing uh, should be uh, more important. Why are we always choosing uh, that uh, what is maybe uh, more cheap? Um, when you know that the way uh, that the, the, the uh, circumstances, the labor circumstances are not always good. We prefer to pay more when we know that the labor cir circumstances uh, are better. Uh, and that's also in the idea of the donut economy, of a circular uh, economy. So um, I hope uh, we will have a, a situation that we will only choose that, that is circular donut perspective and also benefits more people in the city and not one uh, person or one company. I think, yeah, just, just on, your, on your question as well, Richard, I think that... Um... EU, EU procurement law doesn't have to be a problem. So we, we um, the work that we did in Preston was done within the context of us still being part of, of the European Union. And um, I suppose to, to get over some of those problems, that, that's why it's important to break the contracts down so that they're not the higher value ones. If, if, if we want, if, if we see an, 
this, listen, there are some contracts where maybe it does make sense for it to kind of be a big, big multinational to deliver it. You know, maybe, you know, we're not saying, we're not saying every single contract necessarily has to be, has to be delivered locally, but kind of the, there are so many more contracts that could be, and there's so much more that we could do to support a local economy. And I think, you know, you can get around some of those, um, requirements of EU procurement law by making the contracts if you, if you have a lot of smaller contracts then you don't have to go out to tender in the same way as you would do as, as, as it being a, a bigger contract um yeah it, it, and it, the, the, the local is important as Simeon says but you know as, as I was saying as well that it's it is more about the type of organization well it's as much about the type of organization as it is about how local it is so your point about a startup could you could you could use one you could use a startup perhaps because it's you know it's it's delivering a, a, a social benefit but you know if there is a, obviously as Simeon says if there's a particular need within Amsterdam to, to kind of develop the local economy then you know why wouldn't you favor the Amsterdam economy over over the Bulgarian economy Amsterdam has plenty of problems of its own that it needs to solve and and using procurement and spend to solve them should should be a mechanism that's available to you and and, and used I think so yeah all right thanks I also see uh, Mark has raised his hand Yes, uh, next year I will actually be uh, running for our uh, representation in uh, the neighborhood of Pernis in Rotterdam. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, yeah, Preston is, uh, well, a city with a couple of hundred thousand uh, inhabitants, uh, Amsterdam, Southeast, uh, not sure if it's a hundred thousand plus, but still pretty big uh how local can you go uh with community wealth building is it something that could be implemented in say a small town of five thousand inhabitants i would say so yeah i mean you're always going to have you know even even towns with the five thousand inhabitants they're probably going to have a local municipality they'll have they'll, they'll probably be a hospital there might be a college There'll be housing associations, perhaps schools, public institutions where you can start to think about, you know, harnessing these assets in, in the kind of way that, that we're talking about. So, but of course, context is, is very different. You know, it will, community wealth building would look different in a town with 5,000 people than it would look like in Preston. It will look very different in Amsterdam. Than it will in Preston. Simeon's point about there being so much more international finance in a city like Amsterdam, there isn't really any international finance in, in Preston, you know, so it's a very different set of contexts. So community wealth building in, in Amsterdam might have to do more about thinking about how do we deal with international finance. But yeah, I'll, I'll let Simeon perhaps speak to that point. But yeah, I think it, it can work anywhere, but it's, you know, it's, it's going to be different. I, I think it can, can work uh, everywhere. Um, Southeast has um, almost 100,000 people. Uh, I think for a small place, for example, 5,000 people, a place that is maybe next to a city, place, small, small villages in the Netherlands have a problem that young people leave the village. They leave the area and go to the city uh, for many reasons. Um, and how can you uh, invest in those people, those young people to stay in the village? For example, have houses. We now have the problem with, we have a housing crisis in the Netherlands. Uh, for, for most people, uh, they cannot afford it. And when you apply for a social housing, you, you, sh you should wait for 15 years on the waiting list. And there, there is an example in the Netherlands from a small city where the people themselves, they started their own um, house uh, cooperation, housing cooperation. Um, and that is the way they kept their young people in their village. So I think this method can be used, especially for young, young uh, villages, for small villages. <laughs> yeah. Cool, sounds good. I love this, an inspiring example of the, uh, of the uh, housing uh, cooperation, uh, I think. Yeah. I also read about an, uh, a, a, a small town that bought uh, the local uh, shopping center that was going okay. bankrupt. They bought it and they, um, they let local, um, local entrepreneurs uh, st start there without uh, aiming to earn money from it. But uh, it really helped to keep the, 
community alive. Uh, uh, in, can I, can I, can I re reply on that really short? Because I know there are many yeah, sure. people who want to uh, ask a question. The example you gave, uh, the example you gave about the shopping center. I I really want to invite people who are listening to come visit Southeast, the Balm. Um, yeah, the, a lot of people they go to the arena, to the music in industry, but try to come a bit more into the in, inner part of uh, Southeast, into the shopping center of Amsterdam Support. We have CBRE, who is the owner of this uh, 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 shopping center. I don't know if you know CBRE, but if there is one example of a capitalist CEO, shareholder company who has no interest in uh, 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 people who live in an area, then, it's, then it is uh, uh, CBRE. And you see it. We have uh, uh, the, the emptiness of the, We have a lot of uh, 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 sh shops who are empty for maybe eight years. Maybe 50% of the uh, stores are empty. What does that mean for an area? The way you can live in an area? What does that do with safetyness, with a lot of problems? Already we had those problems as one of the vulnerable parts of the Netherlands and the government can do nothing because they own the, the, the place. They own that public uh, space since it is possible because of our new liberal way of doing that. So I really want to invite you to do that. And I'm inspired by this example that those people, they bought the, the shopping center. I'm going to do research on that. Nice. I see some other question by uh, Bob van der Kork. Uh, I have a question for Simeon, because you told about uh, the uh, headquarters in the in the area of Southeast uh, Amsterdam. Do you can you regulate um, their settlements in the area because they take their own workers with them? Can you regulate that kind of things that they can take 50% and the rest they have to hire in from the area? Yeah, um, we cannot force them. We cannot, we cannot force them to do that. Um, in, in the proposal we uh, submitted, we asked the mayor Femke Halsema to do research if we can force them. It is not easy and I, we think it's not possible yet. Since of the neoliberal system we have. Um, so the way we are going to do is uh, uh, talking with them, uh, stimulate them uh, to, uh, to cooperate uh, with us. And of course, we are really going to do, do research on what harder ways we can, we can think of uh, in maybe forcing them, but we don't really have a lot of um, options, mm. I'm afraid. Seems like one for the national government, uh, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, the national government we have is already uh, so liberal for more than 10 years, so we see the effect when we look at inequality and especially these areas. When we look at all those young people who, who use violence uh, or do drug smuggling, there's no nothing uh, that's not good, of course not, but it comes from somewhere. 10 years ago, it started when they needed to be helped. But uh, the, 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 the youth care was getting cuts. And we now see all those vulnerable people. I think everyone who is Dutch here recognizes it, that you see a lot of vulnerable people on the streets now. Uh, and that's the system we, we, we we, we got from them. So we really need to fight this and start the movement because it can be different. Yeah, and I thought it's easier for expats to get a home. There are yeah. some regulation to make it easy for them to get a home in the neighborhood of their, uh, the headquarter, I thought. So it's so... Mm -hmm. The only thing is that they can afford it because their company pays 2,000 euros a month. That's the only thing that talks money. 
Mm. Uh, yeah. I'm afraid. Um, and what we do as a city, we, uh, we try to be a fearless city since our national government is not, yeah, is doing things different. We look at, yeah, how can we solve it? I, I want to respond on that, but it maybe takes it too much away of the team. And I hear myself talking a lot now. <laughs> no problem. You're still saying inspiring things, so uh, don't worry. Um, we're running towards the end of the uh, webinar, unfortunately, but um, uh, I think uh, the webinar so far is, is a great success. So we're really planning on, uh, on planning some more on, uh, on local economies. Um, I think there's still room for one more question. Question, does anyone have a question? I speak no so good English, so I, I, I tell the vraag aan jou, Gaas, and you say in, in English. Yeah, I'll translate. The whole world is the last decennia a supermarket geworden. Ik weet, ik vind leuk wat die mensen in Zuidoost proberen en duurzaam en economie. Maar is dat de reëel? Omdat ik vind persoonlijk een utopie gezien dat jij bijvoorbeeld als ondernemer, jij, ik, ik woon in de andere kant van de wereld, ik produceer product A en de prijs is, niet, is, is voor jou aantrekkelijk wat mee in komt te doen wat iemand anders van jou staat. Ik denk dat gewoon een beetje utopie. Ja, duidelijk. Uh, I think this is one for, uh, for Tom. She has a lot of experience, I think, with uh, especially this question as well. Uh, the question was, uh, is, it a bit, uh, is it a bit of a, a, a utopic idea to think that you as a, as a local economy can change the uh, global neoliberal system in which... Uh, of course, when you want something, you're going to buy it something that's made in China. That's a way a lot cheaper. How can you change those economic processes as, 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 as a local politician or as a city council? Well, I mean, that's that's quite a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge that, that we all face. It's, it's, it's kind of challenging the global economic system as it is. But I think, you know, Simeon's point about this being a movement and, you know, solidarity and starting out with small incremental steps and sharing ideas and showing the power of how these ideas can work in place is the way that we have to start. You know, we have to start somewhere. We have to take small steps to, to challenge the system that we have. We can't pretend that it's going to end the dominance of neoliberalism overnight, but, you know, with the success of areas like Preston, we've seen, as, I, as I was saying in, in, in my presentation, Scotland is a national government now that is that is committed to community wealth building as, as, as a set of economic principles. That feels like quite a big win to me. You know, the fact that in, in Amsterdam, you're, you're kind of, you're, 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 you've, you've adopted donor economics. You're trying to implement community wealth building principles as well. I think these are all wins and we've got to kind of stick together as a movement and celebrate them and, and publish, publish, publicize them as far as we can, you know, be kind of talking about them on social media, contacting journalists, talking to journalists about it, celebrating it, trying to get it into the national media, talking about it on the radio, on television, wherever we can. You know, it's through those kind of steps that we can start to incrementally challenge neoliberalism, but it's not going to happen overnight, and it is, and it is a challenge. Uh, Arnie, you had a question. Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm thinking about the anchor institutions, and the difference perhaps between United Kingdom and uh, the Netherlands, and it's related to the question of the big cities and. Uh, small villages in the in the land. In Holland, uh, the last uh, 10, 20 years, the government has diminished the, the anchor institutions. They have become more um, um, through through the market, neoliberal. So I, I have the idea we don't have so much powerful anchor institutions. They have a lot of restrictions. And there was a publication um, uh, some weeks ago that the investment of in anchor institutions from public for public services is uh, most in big cities and very much 
um, more straight, more um, for, very much less in the in the villages and in, in the in the country. So I was wondering, um, perhaps a question for Tom, but also for Simeon, the the uh, presence of big institutions. Um, I think England has a national health service, which is very powerful and some more institutions from of that. But in Holland, we don't have that many anymore. So even the housing corporations don't have the possibilities they had 10 years ago. I think it's I think it's not so not so different in in in, in England that we, we have we've 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 also seen the erosion of, of public institutions and the outsourcing of services to the market, uh, which is kind of which has again diminished power. What what we what we are seeing in in the UK though now is again through the adoption of of, of these progressive ideas is councils starting to insource some of the services again so take services that they had once put out to the market and bring them back under state control. You know we're seeing that a lot within social care at the moment. So, you know, I think there is the opportunity to swing the other way. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we do have the National Health Service, but again, there are, there are actually quite a lot of restrictions on the National Health Service. That's like, we could do a whole other webinar on the, on the challenge of, of trying to bring the National Health Service into this into this discussion. It's not as easy as you might think, but they're, they are doing a lot of good stuff and it's getting better. But yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's not so dissimilar. And I think, again, it's through the adoption proliferation of, of new ideas and alternative ideas and challenging old traditional ways of doing things that we can start to kind of to move forward. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add to that shortly, Simeon? And because you have experience, of course, with, uh, with uh, getting uh, anchor institutions along in the Netherlands, or do you also think it's, it's something else in the small cities, small towns? Of course, I recognize what you said yeah, about the situation in the Netherlands, um, uh, but I think there are more options than uh, we think, uh, than you might think. Uh, a lot of semi public uh, institutions, they do, uh, they do something with uh, INCO, they still have power to do their own thing. And one example, what we did, it also has to do with power. We should uh, create a situation that, in, that the Greens in Europe, the Greens in Netherlands, become uh, more powerful. What we did when we uh, were in, in charge is we stopped the selling of public uh, uh, facilities, uh, of public uh, buildings, for example. Before we were in power, the VVD was selling all the buildings, the public buildings, uh, but we stopped that. And we want to facilitate all those initiatives in those buildings. So there are options possible, small, sometimes bigger. Thank you. Thanks. All right, the last uh, question. Fred, you have your hand raised. Could Tom elaborate more on the the Ensure Institute and, and are there also a private uh, enterprises as uh, Ensure Institutes? Yeah, yeah, I can. I mean, it's 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 a good question. It's a good question, Fred. I mean, it's 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 actually an area that it's not so advanced at the moment. We we I think we you know it's we're not typically when we've got these groups of anchor institutions together in a locality. It does. It hasn't as yet involved big private institutions coming on board, but we don't want to deny the possibility of that happening in the future. We're, we, we're tentatively in some areas, we're seeing perhaps football, large football clubs thinking about kind of, you know, coming on board as, 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 as key anchor institutions. Um, but yeah, it's more, we, I, I, I talked about private institutions because I don't want to discount them. I think that my hope and ambition is that, again, as this grows, that, corporate responsibility within bigger private institutions will start to say, well, you know what, we should be thinking about um, spending our money in a more progressive way as well. We should be thinking about employing people from areas of, of deprivation. We should think about how we can use our land for the benefit of our community. So it's, it is, it's a, bit more, a bit more aspirational at the moment. We don't necessarily have any private institutions part of those networks at the moment. All right, thanks, Tom. 
and uh, that was the last question for tonight. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to be the last question you ask to each other. I uh, really encourage you to uh, keep on talking, uh, as Simeon said. Um, we have a communication channel within GroenLinks for all the council members. Plek, please start sharing your policy examples uh, there as well. And um, of course, at uh, coming uh, webinars, uh, uh, I hope to organize some more next year. Um, for now, I would like to thank Tom and Simeon for your inspiring talks. I really learned a lot of it. And uh, I've already uh, read a lot about community wealth building. So I, I was glad you had to tell some more about it. Uh, I, really, uh, I really learned something. Uh, thank everyone else for uh, adding to the discussion and uh, asking great questions. So uh, I hope to see you all uh, at the next webinar. Goodbye. Thanks so much, everybody. It's been a real pleasure. Real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.